we don't have the right to subordinate other people uh, to our ends or treat them as objects for our uses. And that is a fundamental kind of equality that I think is at the root of libertarianism. Hi, my name is Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We're here at Libertopia 2012 in San Diego. I'm here with Roderick Long, professor of philosophy at Auburn University and president of the Molinari Institute. Roderick, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here. Your topic here at Libertopia is race, gender, and anarchy. Why should those interested in reducing the size and scope of government be interested in discussing ideas like race and gender? So on the one hand, you have libertarians uh, for whom the, uh, you know, the defining principle of whether something counts as a rights violation is whether it counts as a physical invasion of your person or your justly acquired property or the threat thereof, something like that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have uh, people on the left who are concerned with systems of oppression based on race or gender or class or various other things that don't seem to count as rights violations in, you know, by libertarian standards. And so as a result, these two groups tend to be somewhat hostile to each other. But I think that both sides are mistaken. You can perfectly happily embrace a you know, robust understanding of the non-aggression principle and you know, not soften it or you know, weaken it or or uh, anything like that, and the still at the same time think that the left definitely onto something when they talk about these forms of oppression that are not directly forms of rights violations. Let's say you know there's an employer who clearly discriminates against some sort of group, whether it's women or a certain race or people with disabilities. Right now we have laws to combat that. That would be the use of force. What's a non-aggressive way to fight back against that sort of discrimination? In many ways. The, although the state has, our, has laws against discrimination, the state indirectly does things that tend to, to make, you know, either to incentivize discrimination or at least make it easier. So many traditional libertarians will argue that there can't really be that much genuine discrimination in the, in the market because the market would, you know, would tend to penalize people who hire on the basis of something other than, uh, at least who systematically hire on the basis of something other than competence. If women operate at the same productivity uh, and you could pay them less money, more people would hire them because it's better for the bottom line. That's the argument, That's the that, argument. that they make and you're saying is incorrect. Okay, well here's what I think was wrong with that is that, well, first of all, uh, we're not in a free market and when you have these larger and more hierarchical firms, which are I think in many ways less efficient but are able to, be, to survive because they're able to socialize their costs through government privilege, one of the things that happens is that the people making these decisions in these firms have a hard time determining what the productive contribution of a particular employee is. You've got a whole bunch of people working together and then you've got some employer high, you know, high up who's sort of distant from what's going on on the floor anyway and they have to make their decisions and there isn't that much price feedback so the decisions are going to be based on their judgments and their judgments might very well be influenced and that, you know, not necessarily by hostility to women though there is certainly is such a thing but by, you know, if they, if they come in with sort of a presupposition that women are less productive than men, well, that won't get corrected, and even if it's wrong. And so they're more likely to make decisions on that basis, and so you'll see that kind of thing go on. So that's just an example of So you're saying kind of it's the regulatory state that has created these giant firms that may engage in bad practices, uh, and that is, so it's that's more, why That's one this, of the sources. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that there can't be um, you know, that there can't be sort of systematic bad things happening in a free market, too. So what you do know, we do about this? Various kinds of, of private associations, consciousness raising groups, uh, unions, which is a scary word for a lot of libertarians, but, you know, we're not talking about unions with government privileges, we're talking about associations of workers, you know, joined together and demanding certain conditions as part of their bargaining and so forth. There are, you know, non-coercive ways of achieving these things, and if you know, if libertarianism is right, then those are going to be more effective than you know, one-size-fits-all, top-down, bureaucratically imposed uh, coercive solutions. When we're talking about you know, race, gender, sexuality, any of these kind of categories, a discussion arises also about political correctness. And you've written about political correctness. It's a term that uh, tends to scare a lot of libertarians, but you say that maybe not all political correctness is uh, a threat to free speech and 
maybe there's a need for it. Political correctness refers to a, you know, a whole bunch of different stuff. And as is often the case with terms that refer to a whole bunch of different stuff, some of it's good and some of it's bad. So when people talk about political correctness, they often worry about certain kinds of uh, very you know, intolerant thought control and, um, and so forth. And you know, that, that exists and that is practiced under the form of political correctness and I think it's harmful. But many of the things that get dismissed as mere political correctness I think are you know, sensible uh, attempts at, uh, you know, at civility and at recognition of genuine you know, harms and inequities that people have faced. Libertarians often say, well, why should we pay any attention to you know, feminists, for example? Because you know, the feminists, most feminists are not libertarian. They're anti-libertarian. They want all kinds of government stuff. So why should we care about them? Of course, then the feminists can say, why should we care about libertarians? Most of them are anti-feminist. Well, which I think is an equally fair point. But there was a time in the 19th century when you, got, you didn't get this divide as much. 19th century libertarians, particularly many of the 19th century American individualist anarchists, saw the state and racial oppression and gender and class and all these things as sort of interlocking systems of oppression. They were much more nuanced about these things, many of them anyway, were. But I think that around the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, sort of libertarians and left went their separate ways. And libertarians sort of specialized in understanding you know, how markets work and how government intervention works. Mm -hmm. And the left has spent more time specializing in understanding how, uh, you know, how sort of non-governmental forms of oppression work and on how sort of non-market forms of voluntary association work. And each one came with some very valuable insights in, in the stuff that they were working on, but tended to lose track of the other stuff. And I think that if you bring the two sides together, you, and bring the main insights of the two sides together, you can really have a much more powerful social theory. Another idea that's uh, typically associated with the left is equality. You talk about something called equality of authority. If we're all equal in authority, that means I don't have the right to impose anything on you without your consent. You don't have the right to impose anything on me without my consent. We don't have the right to subordinate other people uh, to our ends or treat them as objects for our uses. And that is a fundamental kind of equality that I think is at the root of libertarianism, that libertarianism is a profoundly egalitarian doctrine in that sense. We'll leave it at that. Thanks very much uh, for talking with us, Roderick Long. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller.